Amen. All right, in our last time together, we were looking at Revelation 19, and who can remember what was happening at the end of Revelation chapter 19? There were some horses, and some riders on horses, and what was happening? They were coming from heaven to the earth. And we saw there was a, a, a rider on the horse there whose name was King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and also uh, his name is called the Word of God. A picture of Jesus and the second coming. Well, uh, Revelation chapter 20 picks up the train of thought right after what we saw at the end of Revelation 19 and the second coming of Jesus. And we're going to find what happens next, rather. And it's been called uh, the thousand years of the millennium. So just a few pieces of, of introduction as we uh, get started. And where does the word millennium come from? It's actually not in the Bible. The word millennium is a compound word uh, that's just taken from milli, meaning a thousand, and annum, or the word we get for a year, like an annual. If you're in school and you get an annual every year, it comes out yearly. But milli annum is just a thousand years. And this is a, a, a phrase that's used here in Revelation 20 several times. And the word itself, millennium, is not mentioned in uh, the Bible, but it's referred to as a thousand year period. So what we have is a period, a time period of a thousand years. And what we're going to be looking at this evening are a number of events that are described that happened at the beginning of the millennium, a number of events that happened during the millennium, and then a number of events that happened at the end of the millennium. So by the end of our time this evening, I will have the same timeline and there will be Maybe 15 different pieces all up here from things we're going to see uh, tonight. But that is the center of focus, and it relates to the time after Jesus comes. So we're looking forward into the future as we look at this topic. And it's interesting because there are a number of different ideas or views about the millennium. In general, uh, there are three major views. There are premillennialists who believe that Jesus comes before the thousand year time period, which would be the view that I would subscribe to and I believe the Bible mentions. And there are those that are post-millennialists who believe that there is a thousand years of peace on earth and then after that is when Jesus comes again to take the saints back with him. And then there's also a view called amillennialism or amillennialists who subscribe to that view. And that is the belief that there's not a literal thousand year time period but it's just a concept in the scriptures, but you can't basically uh, lay down any specific time frame to it. It's just a general, um, not a literal time period. So these are just three dominant views that, that some Christians have. And there's also a number of questions that Christians have that relate to this time period that we understand uh, from the scriptures is yet future. Number one, what happens after Christ comes? Well, that's what we saw at the end of Revelation 19, the second coming of Jesus. So we're going to find out in chapter 20, what is the condition of the earth after Jesus comes? People have asked that question. What happens to Satan at the second coming of Jesus? We're going to find the answer to that also tonight. When does God make the earth new? That will be answered as well this evening. And then finally, is there anyone alive on earth during the thousand years? Anyone living during this 1,000 year time period, according to the Bible, We'll also find out the answer to that. Now, what I have next for you, if you don't take any notes tonight, you want to write this down. Uh, this is something that has helped me dramatically, tremendously in studying Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20 is not written in linear fashion. And if you try to read those 15 verses in a strictly linear fashion, you will get confused. I have gotten confused. But if you understand that it's actually laid out in cycles, there are three cycles in Revelation chapter 20 that are, are presented there. And those cycles repeat the same information of the beginning of the millennium, the, the time during the millennium. I can't even say the word now. And the events at the end of the millennium. I can't say the word. But what happens, I'm just going to say a thousand years. Oh, easy. The thousand years. But there's a separate focus for each of the three cycles. So if you're taking notes down, you want to write at least these three lines. And I can put this up here at the end or something else. Don't, don't worry if you don't happen to get it all written down. The first three verses 
describe what happens to Satan and the condition of the earth before, during, and after the millennium. That is the first cycle that's repeated. You have the whole element of the beginning of the millennium, the middle, and the end. And the focus on those verses is Satan and the condition of the earth. The second cycle that we find in chapter 20 is in verses 4 through 10. And in that cycle, the focus is on God's people and what happens to God's people at the beginning and during and after the millennium. And so that's obviously a very important piece. And then the third cycle that we're going to find actually includes the last Verses and the first verse of the next chapter, if you notice that, it goes from chapter 20, verse 11 to 21, 1. And in these, uh, this cycle, rather, it describes what happens to the wicked before, during, and after the millennium. So do you see how there's three cycles and they're going over the same ground in three different focuses of, of information? That's, that's if, if you don't understand that, it, you'll get very confused. And I've gotten confused reading this before because I've studied it and studied it and studied it and have, have seen and discovered uh, this simple principle and outline is the way that God is giving the information. It helps tremendously in understanding what we're going to read. As you see, these elements right here that are the structure of why the, or how the information is, is given. Does everybody understand? Is that clear? Do you want me to wait another half a second or two for that? I'll come back at the end. If anyone wants it at the end, I'll come back and put this up here. So don't stress out too much. Okay, let's read the first verse of chapter 20. And we know the focus is on Satan and the condition of the earth. Revelation chapter 20, verse 1. John says, and I saw an angel come down from where? And what does he have? Having, a, having the key of the bottomless pit and something else, a great chain in his hand few symbolic pieces of elements now revelation 20 has symbolic and literal language uh, throughout as well as much of revelation does but john says i saw and these events follow on the heels immediately of the horses that are coming jesus and the angels at the second coming right at the close of the chapter 19 we he immediately is presented with this information this angel coming down from heaven on a specific mission and descending to earth, and we've talked about a key before, way back with the seven churches, uh, what was it, with the sixth church, the church of Philadelphia, uh, with a key. Key is a symbol of authority and power, and so the fact that this angel comes down from heaven with a key shows that heaven has control over the events that are about to happen here that we're going to see specifically in the first three verses. So uh, the next piece here in this verse the word bottomless pit is actually a misfortunate translation in the King James Version. Some of you might have different versions. Bottomless pit in that idea just sounds like a hole where there's no, there's no bottom, right? There's no end. It just falls into nothingness. Well, technically, the word that's translated here, bottomless pit, is the Greek word abusos. And it's where we get our word for abyss. And the meaning of the Greek word abyss is really not a, a, a bottomless hole so much as a dark, desolate wasteland, and this is a description of the earth, rather, that the devil is actually going to be chained and bound, as it were, to this earth, in not in a bottomless hole that doesn't end, but actually restricted to the earth, which is in a state of desolation. It's interesting to notice that after the seven last plagues fall, it is almost kind of the reverse of creation. As the days of creation created the earth, and the plants and animals and trees and grass, the seven last plagues rather are a, a return back to the original state. And in fact, if you read Genesis 1 verse 2, the second verse of the Bible in, uh, and I don't mean to confuse anyone with some of the language up here, the LXX is a book called the Septuagint. The Septuagint is a Greek translation that was written back in the time of, of the Greek language of the Old Testament. And the word that's translated there in Genesis 1 verse 2 for the condition of the earth at the creation before it was before God you know, created things is the word abyss. So what we're seeing is the earth is returned in a general sense to the condition it was in before creation. After the second coming and the desolation of the earth um, at Jesus' second coming, we're seeing the earth return to that pre-creation condition uh, in a state of just darkness and desolate um, emptiness, and that is where the devil is chained 
obviously this is symbolic. You wouldn't hold the devil with some kind of literal chains. It is a chain, rather, of circumstances. His condition, he is restricted to being forced to stay on earth. And when Jesus came, do you remember what happened? His garment was all splattered with, you know, with red. And we read about because that was actually the blood of treading the wine press of his enemies. All the wicked who are living when Jesus comes are destroyed. All of them. And so Satan, because the wicked are all dead, Satan has no one to tempt or deceive. There's nothing to do but to sit and think about what he has done over the course of his sinful work on earth for 6,000 years. If you follow the biblical chronology, the earth is about 6,000 years old from the time of creation of Adam and Eve until the time we're living today. Now, evolutionists would scoff and laugh at that, but evolutionists don't believe the Bible. I take the Bible and what the Bible says as being authentic and factual and what God himself has said and inspired, so as fully true, about 6,000 years old. So this chain, then, the devil has nothing to do. And I looked up something this afternoon just uh, for my own information. What is sometimes considered to be the worst punishment for a prisoner who goes to jail or in prison? Solitary. solitary confinement. And without question, when you just type in solitary confinement in Google and start looking around and people are like, this is wrong, this is a form of torture, this is bad, it's, it's really, it's cruel and unusual punishment and all these things, but in a sense, it is, uh, it is something that the devil, because he's been so busy and active in deceiving and, and harassing people on earth, since the time of Adam and Eve, he's not had time for reflection and thinking about what he has actually done in warring against God and trying to fight against him. And so here he is going to be given a thousand years to think about what he has done and to tremble for the judgment that will be future for him at the end of the thousand years. So a time of reflection with nothing to do with being forced to think about you know, sometimes if you do something wrong or bad, maybe maybe I shouldn't be saying this out loud, but you can just stay busy and kind of forget about it and just push it back and push it back and it's like it didn't really happen or something. But when you have to stop and think, maybe I'm the only one who got put in time out when I was little for things I did wrong. And I'd rather get a spanking than be put in time out. Because time out is just you're, you're sitting in your room staring at the walls and nothing to, nothing to do. Just whip me and let me go out the door again. No. Uh, my sister, she liked to stay in her room, so she would get spankings. I got spankings, too. I didn't like to stay in my room, and so I had to go to my room. And anyway, it was different kids, different things that were affecting me. Discipline. So, all right. So let's continue on now with verse 2. And it says, the angel came down, and he laid hold on who? The dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him how long? For a thousand years, there's that expression again, lay hold that this angel that is sent from heaven seizes, grabs a hold in a symbolic way of, of Satan. And it's interesting, this expression here, the dragon, the devil, and Satan, is the same way of describing the dragon, devil, and Satan in Revelation chapter 12, in verse 9, uh, where he also appears there as he's making war against uh, God's church. But this is a picture of the binding of of Satan where he is forced and restricted to stay on earth with nothing to do but think about what he has done. And I believe this view here, uh, I know we're dealing with a lot of symbolic language, but I believe when it says a thousand years that it's actually literally a thousand years. Some people, uh, I understand, take the view that this thousand years is prophetic, and if you were to do that, a thousand years in prophetic time would be 360,000 literal years. If the millennium is prophetic time. So, you know what, you can believe that if you want to, but would it take 360,000 years to accomplish what we're going to see here in the millennium? I, I just, I, I think that this is um, literal time. And if you go to 2 Peter 3, verse 8, all of you probably are familiar with, uh, where it says, Peter is saying, a day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years is as a day. And then he goes into verse 9, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise. Not willing that any should perish. Well, let's continue on now to verse 3, where it says that this angel, he bound him for a thousand years and cast him where? Bottomless, Bottomless pit. There's that word of Usos again. And shut him up and set a what upon him? 
seal upon him that he should do what? Deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled or finished. And then after that, he might be, he must be loosed. How long? A short time, a little season. If you have King James, must be loosed a little season. So here again, this bottomless pit, you know, that's the Greek word abusos. And it's referring to the earth in a state of confusion, darkness, and just destruction after the second coming of Jesus has destroyed the earth and the wicked at his coming and all the effects of the seven last plagues that happened upon the earth leading up to that coming of Jesus. And Jesus comes in the seventh plague, the battle of Armageddon. So what has been the policy of the devil? Deception, to deceive the nations. And that is just that stands out in my mind every time I read these, these words as a reminder that I need to be close to my Bible so that the devil doesn't deceive me in, in what he's trying to do. That is his policy. His, his, his modus operandi is to deceive in some way. And sometimes the deceptions are so deceptive that they don't seem like a deception. But the Bible is the great detector and revealer of truth. Always the Bible is our standard and foundation. When we rest on the Word of God, you are resting on a truthful, solid foundation that cannot be moved. And it says that he would not be able to deceive the nations because the earth has been depopulated. There's no one alive. All the wicked dead we're going to see are, well, they're actually just dead. And the, the righteous we're going to see as we go into our next cycle are all taken to heaven. And they're going to be involved in something there in heaven. But then it says after this time period of a thousand years, it is necessary that Satan be loosed from his binding. And this loosing, I believe, is really going to be uh, represented uh, when the end of the millennium comes, an event happens that we'll read about coming up in a second. Something's going to happen that will be a, a way of loosing Satan from his circumstances. And then it just says the, the expression here, a little season, just means a little time. It doesn't say exactly numerically how long, but we're going to see as we read this chapter, it'll at least be long enough for the dragon to deceive all the wicked who are resurrected at the end of the millennium, the wicked dead rather, and they're going to try to try to take the holy city, the new Jerusalem. They're going to circle it and try to take the city, and then we'll find out what happens. Uh, the wicked will be completely destroyed at that point. Now, Revelation 20 verse 4 is the longest verse in the New Testament for those of you trivia people. So I'm going to have to read that. I don't have that memorized. Revelation 20 verse 4 the long, not in the whole Bible, the longest verse in the whole Bible is, I think, Esther 8, chapter 9. But that's in the Old Testament. Long verse here. Let's read it together. Verse 4. John says, and I saw what? Thrones. Thrones. And they said, this is our new cycle. This is the focus is on the righteous. And they sat upon them. And what was given unto them? Judgment. Judgment. And I saw the souls of them that were what? Beheaded. Why? For the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not done what? Worship. worship the beast, neither his image, and neither had received what? His mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And now notice this is the righteous. And what did they do? They lived and reigned with who? With Christ a thousand years. <laughs> okay. So here is a picture in a new cycle of what is happening for the righteous. And we're going to see uh, it is very implied, I think, in the way it's expressed here. At the second coming of Jesus, all the righteous dead are resurrected to life in what is called the first resurrection. I'm going to have a slide that gets to that, but I'm just leading in with that already right now. All of the righteous who have died before Jesus comes again will be resurrected in what's called the first resurrection. At the end of the millennium, there's another resurrection called the second resurrection, and that is not the one you want to be part of. That is the resurrection of the wicked. So but all the righteous, first resurrection. So all of them, both the living, because there are some, when we've read in Revelation before, there's going to be some people living when Jesus comes. They are going to also be taken to heaven with Jesus. And during this time, it says, John says, I saw thrones, and they that sat upon them, and judgment was given to them. Thrones are a symbol of authority to exercise as a ruler or as a, as a judge. In fact, if you go to Matthew 19, 28, Jesus tells the 12 apostles that they would be sitting on 12 thrones judging the tribes of Israel. 
And in an extended sense, that applies to all the believers as well in this time period, sitting on thrones. Now, what are they judging? We'll, we'll get to that. And they're sitting on their seats here. Now, the word judgment here in the Greek is the word crima. And that means to give a sentence or a verdict or to render a decision. And what kind of verdict or decision are they going to be doing? They're judging in some sense. And since the saints are sitting upon thrones, this indicates that they are the ones who will pronounce the sentence. Well, we're going to find that during this, uh, during this time period, let me read this first before we move on to it. This passage, rather, right here in verse 4, is an allusion, not an illusion, an allusion, which means it's referring back to something else that's already mentioned. In Daniel chapter 7, 22, where Daniel says, judgment was given to the saints of the Most High. That prerogative and position of exercising judgment was given to the saints of the Most High. And we find in Revelation 20, when that occurs is during the time of the millennium. That's when that actually happens for this um, passage that was given here by Daniel. So there is a, a, a verse here, a passage in the scripture. This is not Revelation, but this very clearly describes what's happening at this time. And you can see up here at the top, it says, the saints shall judge the world. The reference here, this is 1 Corinthians 6, 2 and 3, and I actually have it all up here on the screen so that you can see it for yourself. Paul is writing to the Corinthian believers, and he says, do you not know that the saints shall judge the world? And if the world shall be judged by you, what else does he say? Are ye unworthy to judge the smallest matters? And then in verse 3, he says, Know ye not that we shall judge what? Angels. Angels. How much more things that pertain to this life? Paul is telling them, don't you know that we will judge angels? And so what we're going to see is happening in, in Revelation during the millennium is that the saints are sitting on thrones and they are auditing and looking over the, the books of the lives of all the wicked who are dead in their graves or dead on earth. All the wicked. This is how good God is. He wants all of those people who are saved to understand if they have any questions. Why is my mom or dad or son, daughter, grandma, why are they not here? And God says, Here are the, here's the book of their life, the record of all that they said and did and thought from the inside out. You can look over and examine or audit it, if you please. To examine something, you know, an auditor, they just look through, look through and make sure that the numbers and the ledger sheets are all done correctly. They're not cooking the books and trying to make numbers. They are just checking to see, has all the work been done properly? And guess what they're going to find? In every case, God was correct. For why someone, if someone is not there, you might say, well, why is, is Pastor Brian not there? I mean, he seemed to be a nice person, kind of ish. And why is he not there? And you can look and see, well, here's what he was really thinking, and here's what he was doing when no one else was around. And you will be able to see if you have any question that God knew really what was in my heart, and that there's a reason why I am not there. And you will agree that God was right in, in not allowing me and, and taking me there if I shouldn't be there. God forbid, I don't even like to talk that way. I mean, I'm, please, Lord, I don't. I want to be there. When the roll is called up yonder, I want to be there. Yes, Carol. Amen. This is just a little bit off what you're saying, but I do want to say it. You know, if, if you try to follow Jesus, you know, the devil can really give us a hard time, you know, inside our thoughts and feelings. And it just seems it's so much easier to hook up with the devil, and then we're not tortured so much. We're not I read something just, uh, it was the other day, that was so powerful, and it was a statement that said something like, what, this short life of, of struggle and challenges like you're talking about, where we have to fight against the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, 1 John 2, 15. We have to fight against those things, but it will be far more exceedingly worth it once we receive eternal life which is an unending life with God, face to face and the holy angels, and all of whatever struggle is involved in surrendering to God is as meaningless and nothingness if we can just keep our eyes focused on the eternal realities of how wonderful it will be to live with God. What and so, pardon? What was that text you threw out? Oh, uh, that was uh, 1 John 2, uh, verse 15. 
For it just says, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, that's verse 16, I think. The lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And then it says, and the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he or she that doeth the will of my Father, um, but he or she that doeth the will of, of God, abideth forever. I'm, I'm forgetting the last part there. That's verse 17. But if you do the will of God in terms of connect, it says you abide, continue, it's living forever. And that is the, the, the struggles that we face now that we all tend to focus on are, are what we all have to really wrestle and fight against. Because as long as we're looking at Jesus, there's just nothing more precious, nothing more meaningful, nothing that... Uh, I'll give you one of the Hebrews 12 verse 3 just says, Consider him, speaking of Jesus, uh, lest you be wearied in, and faint in your minds. Just consider, think about him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself. He went, I mean, all the things he went through just to say, I want to give salvation to everyone sitting here in the room tonight. I want to make it possible. I won't force you, but I want to make it possible because I love you that much that you could choose and be saved and live with me, but I won't force you. And he just says, consider him. And that's keeping our eyes on Jesus, looking unto him. So the work of judgment will involve a careful investigation of the records of evil men and angels. You can see what Lucifer and the angels that fell with him, what, what, what they have been thinking and doing and what their thoughts were. So that everyone will be convinced of the justice of God in the later final destruction of the wicked. Isn't God good to condescend? I mean, he is so wise and all-knowing and perfect. I mean, he knows that he's perfect, but he wants us to have an intelligent appreciation and, and regard for him to know he did not make any mistakes. He didn't give um, my mother or my sister or my brother a raw deal and keep them out of heaven when they could have been here. But he just was like, ah, eh, just whatever. We can see all of what he has said. You know, someone else described this, this time as like instant replay where you have an umpire and if somebody's running to the first base and the umpire calls them out and it's a close play and people are like, wait a second, let's go to the replay. Was he really, was he really out? And you look at the replay, and it shows ever so closely, oh, yes, he is out. And you're going to find, just in another way, whether it's auditing or instant replay, that God is perfect in all of his decisions that he has made. Yes? Right there. It's a continual process. And so, did Paul say, I wouldn't have known what covetousness was unless the Bible said don't covet? And so, God allows, in my relationship, He allows me to see these things that have been a part of my old nature or my sin nature or my living in this world so that I can fix my eyes on him so that he can make that right in me because I can't really fix that. You know, I have to just keep bringing it back to him. Amen. And I, him, he, does, he has to do that. I can't Amen. Philippians 2, 13, for it is God which worketh in you. And I love what you said about Romans 12, 2, and be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That, that transformation process begins in the mind. It's not on my elbow or my knee. I mean, the transformation of my life and all of our lives, it begins when our minds are not conformed with what's the latest movie out this weekend or what's the next American Idol. Thing. What does God have to say to, in his word to me? Yes, we receive Jesus by his word. That's how we actually receive him into our hearts and minds as we study. And when he talks about eat my flesh and drink my blood in John 6, 53 and 54, he's talking about the words that talk about him as the savior, as the, the, the one who gave his flesh and blood for our salvation. When I receive and think on those words, that is receiving Jesus into my life and having Christ in me. The hope of glory is actually having his words in me because that's why he's called his name is called the word of God. And so to receive the word of God is to receive the life of Jesus. 
And that's how the transformation begins. It all comes back to, in such a simple and profound way, to the Bible, the Word of God, that is our foundation for our relationship with God. Because without faith, it's impossible to please God. Hebrews 11, 6. And faith is always the connection, believing His Word. I don't see him physically, I don't hear him audibly, but the connection with him is always, what has he said, and do I believe it? And so that is how it's possible for all of us. It's, for by grace are you saved through faith, believing what he says, that grace comes because we, we read that he's offered it to us. And when I believe his word, that is what, it, it makes it effective, it becomes a reality to the believer once you believe it. But it is... Jesus and the Word are so, they're so connected that to receive the Word of God is to receive Jesus. It's, it's, the, same, it's the same thing, if, if that makes sense or not. So, our, yes, Frank and then Carol. I know your presentation is not about taking questions from the floor. Oh, like, okay. But I, I just like to say above that, you know, my understanding of faith is that faith is that in no way static, it's only dynamic, only dynamic. And it's either growing or weakening. It only is on the move. It never stands still. And so, uh, you know, therefore, if it's growing, even though we have things that are darker spots on our history, the Lord knows our desire. And that growth and strengthening of our faith is our saving relationship. Yes. But it can be weakened. And that's the thing that many people reject, say, no, I'm saved. But it can be weakened. Scripture tells us. Yeah, no, no question. Luke 18, verse 8, there's the parable of the unjust judge. And in verse 8, I think it is, at the end of that parable, Jesus says, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? You know, that parable is about the, the, the widow who is there asking for, for justice and for help, really. And she persists and persists and persists. And it's just a lesson. The whole lesson is about just um, faith that will not give up in asking and pleading for God to help us. Even though, ironically, God is the unjust judge in the parable, he's not unjust, he's not unwilling to help us, but the persistency of asking him d demonstrates the quality of the faith, the, the amount of persistency and consistency and, and perseverance, that's what God is looking for, that's not willing to, you know, just at the first problem that comes along, your faith goes out the window and all of this is terrible. To be like Job and say, though he slay me, yet will I trust in him, Amen. and to have that level of you know, I don't understand why I'm being going through all these things, Job says, but though he's slave, I will still trust, and trust and faith are synonyms uh, in God. Carol? Just real quick, and you know, along with what Frank said, you know, it's just human nature to not want to have to go through discomfort and pain. And I just want to, you know, be healed spiritually and not have to worry about any pain. I mean, that, that's the human side of it. No, no question. No, no question that uh, life is hard, and without uh, without Jesus, it would be even harder, way harder. But it, it's it's very true uh, that we all shrink from trials, oftentimes that really are to to lead, bring us to our knees and lead us to look and, and reach out more to Jesus than we would have otherwise. And I was speaking from my own personal experience uh, that I need to work on and continue to improve. But this verse here, though, really points out that the saints will judge the world. And we find out the timing of that. Revelation 20 tells us that's when they're sitting on thrones during the thousand years. This is still with, still with verse 4, rather. That was a long verse. We have several slides for that. Where it talks about, John says, I saw the souls of them that were beheaded. And here the word soul is just a reference to the actual person or individuals. It's talking about um, the martyrs. That were literally beheaded. In fact, the word Greek in Greek beheaded means to have your head cut off with an axe. Is the literal meaning of that word, um, pelikidzo, pelikidzo. So uh, the, these that have gone through this experience will have the privilege of sitting on thrones. They're mentioned especially by the character of their faith to uh, be a martyr for for God. And for the witness of Jesus, the Word of God, they have been faithful in giving a message and standing up for Jesus. No matter, even though uh, there was a, a message that if you don't worship the beast and his image, you will receive uh, a death decree and you will be killed and be thrown into prison, there are still a group of people that will say, I'm going to follow Jesus and do what is, is pleasing and honorable in his sight, no matter what man thinks. That's where Paul, and, or Peter rather, in Acts 5.32 says, we ought to obey God rather than man. 
that principle, we ought to obey God in every case rather than man. As long as man isn't asking me to do something that's contrary to God, I'll be happy to oblige. Like paying taxes, they tried to trip Jesus up with paying taxes, but he showed them it's not a sin to pay taxes. You give your taxes to Caesar, but you give your worship and your spiritual sacrifices, your prayers go to God. It never goes, worship does not belong to Caesar or the state under any circumstances. It always belongs to God. So there's a separation that Jesus made of church and state. Interesting that John himself was exiled to the island of Patmos, where he's writing down and recording the book of Revelation in verse 9 of the first chapter, you might remember, for the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. In this same regard, he is being persecuted and being sent to this, on exile, to this desolate island out in the Mediterranean Sea because of his witness for Jesus and the message that he was faithful in bearing that is the message of God. Still in verse 4, it describes these people, the righteous, which had not worshipped, um, that is, they had not worshipped the beast and his image. And it's interesting because this really, the description here that describes they had not worshipped is really a an echo of the third angel's message in Revelation 14, which says, If any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of them. At any rate, this whole picture in verse 4 says that these people did not worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in their forehead or in their hand. It's the same language. They did not receive the mark of the beast. They did not worship the beast in any regard, but they were faithful to God. Remember the key issue in the last days is worship in one word. It boils down to worship. Worship the true God and the creator or worship man under the guise in the background is going to be Satan in a false system of worship. So it says they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. And the fact that it says they lived and they were beheaded, it must imply a resurrection. And so when Jesus comes, and I've got a verse for this in a second, 1 Thessalonians 4, uh, 16 and 17, it'll be on the screen, you'll see the whole verse. All the righteous dead are resurrected in what is called the first resurrection, and that is on the front end of the millennium, the very beginning. The, the Greek here, they lived or came to life. And so all the righteous dead, and we're going to look at this verse, I think it's maybe one of the simplest, clearest verses on this point in the whole Bible, but they are resurrected to life, the righteous, when Jesus comes. And it says they reigned with Christ. And so although the wicked are dead, the saints will reign over them in judgment, to determine their punishment after the second resurrection, which is at the end of the millennium. So this is also during the thousand years that they are reigning with Christ. So here's that verse, 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17, which tells us what happens when Jesus comes. And that was also described at the end of Revelation 19. For the Lord who? Himself shall descend from where? From heaven with a shout, with the voice of who? The archangel and with the trump of God and then now we're told after all these things what happens and the dead in Christ shall rise first then the living we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them notice where we're meeting the Lord at where are we meeting him at on the ground no 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 we're meeting him in the air and so shall we ever be with the Lord and I should have put the next verse up here it says wherefore comfort one another with these words the myth the, the, this message is given to comfort and to cheer God's people, because even though we might lose family members and friends to death, it's not the end, because the righteous will have a special resurrection, the first resurrection at the beginning of the millennium, and they will <laughs> reign with Christ for a thousand years, and sitting on thrones with him there in the New Jerusalem. So, notice also that this is a, a key point, that in, in some views of the millennium actually have Jesus or the saints establishing a kingdom on earth and Jesus coming to earth to establish his kingdom on earth for a thousand years. No, 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 no. At the second coming of Jesus, it says the saints meet the Lord in the air and Jesus does not actually come back down to this earth until the end of the thousand years. And we'll see that later on in our study, but that is a, a, a significant detail because if you know that the Lord is not coming back down to this earth physically, if someone were to claim to be Christ on earth, as we know, the devil is going to try and impersonate Christ and his coming on earth in some way. This right here, knowing what the Bible says, would give you protection from the deception that the devil is wanting to put on the rest of the world. Because it cannot be him if they're walking around over here, over there, over anywhere. That's not what the Bible says is going to happen when Jesus comes. They'll be caught up in the air to meet the Lord. Frank. 
Okay, good. Thank you for that echo. Very nice. Okay, let's continue on now in verse 5. We actually have another verse to get to. And I'm moving along like a turtle tonight, as always. Verse 5. It says, now here's also, this verse is also an easy to misunderstand verse. Verse 5, the first sentence here in this should be in parenthesis. In other words, it's a parenthetical statement that is separate from the flow of thought. It breaks up the flow of thought. And I'm not adding to the Bible. You know, the original Bible was not given with punctuation. There were no periods, commas, or anything. It's just letters and words all together. But let me read it, verse 5. But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. So if you read it in without parenthesis, it sounds like that the first resurrection is when? It's after the thousand years, but that's not the case. It's actually the way that it's being written here by John. It's a parenthetical statement because the first resurrection, we'll see clearly as we keep reading, is at the beginning of the millennium. This is a reference to when it says, but the rest of the dead, that's the wicked, live not again. That's going to be living again at the second resurrection. So if you're bold enough, I mean, and this is just me, I, put a per, I just put parenthesis around that part just as a, as a notice to my own mind where it says, but the rest of the dead at the beginning of verse 5, and then where it says, until the thousand years were finished, a parenthesis at the end there, and then this is the first resurrection, is actually referring to verse 4. The first resurrection is referring to the saints that resurrected and lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. That is the first resurrection. All right, I'm getting bogged down. I'm going to keep moving because that's just punctuation and people are like, What's the, why is that important? It just helps to explain what you're reading and understanding what it's actually saying. The rest of the dead, this refers to the wicked dead. All the righteous dead were resurrected in the first resurrection. Jesus in John 5, 28 says, Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in the which all that are in the grave shall hear his voice and shall come forth. They that have done good unto the resurrection of, right, of, of the righteous, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. Resurrection of eternal life, everlasting life. So anyway, Jesus explains himself. There's actually two resurrections, one to everlasting life, one to damnation and everlasting destruction. And that's going to be the second one at the end of the millennium. So the rest of the dead, that is the wicked, did not live until after the, the thousand years were finished. So anyway, let's keep moving on. Verse 6, still talking about the righteous now. It says, blessed and holy is he that hath part in what? The first resurrection. The first resurrection on such the what has no power. Second death. Second death. Now that should... That should sound familiar because we actually had the expression second death in Revelation chapter 2, which was months and months and months ago. It talked about the second death there. We're going to see more on it here tonight and also in our next study, 21. Uh, the, it says, the second death hath no power, but they shall be what? Priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him how long? A thousand years is referring to the saints. This is referring to God's people. And it says, those who are... Having a, that have a part in the first resurrection, they are blessed. They are happy. They should be joyful to be part of that. God is, it's a, the word here refers to God extending his benefits and blessings. And the word here for holy means that you are set apart for a special sacred purpose. And that is true even now today. God has set you and called you apart for a special sacred holy purpose. Something that I learned while looking at some of these words here just for this week, the word holy at its root, root level, one of the, the main connotations is it means different. I mean, different. And so should Christians be fundamentally different than the rest of the world? I mean, visibly, audibly, in, in how they speak, talk, eat. I mean, there should be something that's different, not for the sake of being quirky and different and weird, but for the sake of what is based on the principles of, of truth and righteousness. Now, this expression here, the second death, um, now this might sound confusing, but we're going to see it as we continue on. The wicked die twice. The wicked die twice, and so that's what the second death is referring to. Their first death was their natural death at the end of their life when Christ returned, or whether they died before Christ returned, such as let's just pick someone like Hitler, or Nero, or... You know, I can think of a number of people that we're fairly certain are not going to be part of the first resurrection. They died their first death. But when Jesus comes, 
the wicked dead stay dead, and they're not resurrected again until the end of the thousand years. But at the end of the thousand years, they will rise to meet their punishment and the judgment that's been, the sentence that's been pronounced against them. And it's at that time that some of you have heard of the verse, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. It's at that time, at the end of the millennium, when that will be literally fulfilled. Because the devil and his angels and all the wicked and all the righteous will all at that time be living. The only time on earth that everyone who's ever lived will be living is at the end of the thousand years. I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. But anyway, the second death refers to the death of the wicked that will take place at the end of the thousand years when they receive the sentence that's been pronounced against them. And they themselves will have an intelligent understanding of why they have lost eternal life. And it's not that God was just being cruel and arbitrary, but they will realize we really chose to live for ourselves and not to receive the salvation that's been provided for us at such an infinite cost. God will allow even the wicked the decency of understanding, here's why you are not allowed to enjoy being in the holy city and living with me forever. Yes, Frank. Have you ever heard it guesstimated how many people may have lived in heaven? I have. What, what is the number you And, you know, uh, I think it was something on the BBC one time I had to say, you know, our minds must run the same track, which is kind of scary. Uh, I think it was 80 billion, something along those lines, if I remember correctly. I could be off. This was a number of years ago that someone just guesstimated. Now, the population has tremendously swung up dramatically since the Industrial Revolution in the 1700s. If you go back just a few hundred years ago before the Industrial Revolution, and in all of the mass production and mechanization of machines and equipment, there was much fewer numbers. But with the increase in the food supply, usually always increases in the people supply. I mean, generally speaking, but you got me on history now. All right, look at it. Let's get back to our, our, our prophecy here. So all the wicked are then resurrected at the end of the thousand years um, for the final judgment and are finally destroyed. And we're going to see that if, if I can manage to get to 15 verses uh, this evening. And it says, uh, those who are, this is the righteous, it says the second death has no power over them. And the word power, remember there's several words in Greek that mean the same in English, power? It is the word exousia, which means authority. The second death has no authority, power, no ability to, to, to put someone in that condition of being in the second death, which is, of course, the death in which there is no resurrection, eternal loss and no longer ceasing to exist. The second death will not touch the redeemed. Somebody ought to say amen, right? Amen. 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 Jesus is the resurrection and the life. Still looking now at verse 6. It says the righteous will be priests um, of God and they will reign with him. And a priest, we've, we've seen some of these, these details in other chapters, so I won't spend a lot of time. A priest is someone that offers spiritual sacrifices and um, ministers and serves there uh, in the temple. And so... 1 Peter 2.9 talks about God's people are a royal priesthood, even today, that they offer spiritual sacrifices of praise and gifts of prayer and offerings. And really the sacrifice that, that, that God wants more than our money is really just our hearts. And David understood that in Psalm 51 when he said the sacrifices of God are a broken and a contrite spirit. Um, he understood this, the true sacrifices is not just, I mean, it's yourself and being a living sacrifice Offering your life, your time, your money, your energy, your words, your strength, giving it all as a living sacrifice to God. So they will reign with God in company with God and in company with Christ, not separate and doing their own thing, but in a connection with God. They will be reigning and ruling with him during this thousand years. And so this time period also is another fulfillment of Daniel 7, which some of you were here for that was way back in the, the spring of this year, where it says... And the kingdom and dominion shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High. And so there is that time during the millennium, which we read about, was being referred to way back in the past. That time looking forward uh, that was mentioned, they would be given the, the power and prerogative to reign. So now, verse 7, let's see what happens here. This is a short verse looking at Satan. And when the thousand years are what? Expired, Expired or ended, Satan shall be what? Loosed, released out of his prison. And so the loosing of Satan will really, in a sense, be accomplished when the wicked dead are resurrected back to life again. Because now he has someone to deceive. Now he has a power base, as it were, to try and manipulate and work through. And we're going to see in a futile attempt 
to attack the New Jerusalem, the holy city of God. What a foolish idea, but that is, it just shows how far, once you're deceived, you will go in fighting, thinking you can fight against God in some kind of a physical battle and take the holy city. But when the, the wicked are resurrected to life again, at the end of the thousand years, to receive their punishment, there is a short space when the, the devil has power over them to try and deceive them, and he does. So this prison is the bottomless pit, which is the earth that is desolated, the second coming of Christ, where Satan has been confined for the thousand years. And now we have some symbolic language in verse 8, and it talks about Satan is going to do something. Let's see, in verse 8. And Satan shall go out to do what? To see, this is, at the, this is at the end of the thousand years. Still policy of deception from beginning to end. What did Jesus say about the devil? He is a liar and a murderer from the beginning. John 8, 44. And shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth. Now, what does it say in your Bible? Gog and Magog to gather them together to what? Fight, battle. And now how many people are here among the wicked? This is a really a sad commentary at the end of verse 8. The number of whom is as what? The sand of the sea. So sad that many, many, many people, in fact, sadly, the majority of the human race, the majority, I think by far, will be among the wicked who will be there trying to take the city of God. The, the, the New Jerusalem, by the way, is the capital of heaven. It's God's headquarters for his government. It's the capital city of the universe. And God is actually going to bring that city down to this earth again. We're going to read more about it in chapter 21 in our next study. But it is the capital, and he is bringing it back to this earth, which is the one world that he created. It fell into sin, and he came and lived and died and offered his life. Anyway, it's remarkable. The level of, of distinction that is given to the human race and this planet after such a terrible, you know, Dishonesty, distraction, and, and, and giving in to sin, how this planet will be raised to such an exalted manner by what God has done, not because of anything we have done. Now, some people have asked, what does it mean here about the nations, Gog and Magog? And there is, these words here are mentioned also in Ezekiel 38 and 39. Some of you might have a reference in your Bible. In Ezekiel 38 and 39, it describes a people that live up in the northern regions of where literal Israel was. And it's a description of the wicked, symbolically, coming to attack God's people and being defeated fully and overthrown by God. There in Ezekiel 38 and 39. And that's the same thing that's going to happen here. Gog and Magog represent, symbolically, the wicked host of all ages. As they were literally, and I have a map, don't worry, our next slide is a map of where Magog was. For my map people, that I know you're out there, you can be silent, and, but I know you're there. That want to know where is this place at? Where is it? And uh, we'll see. Yes, okay, up in what is today Russia, and some people say up as far as Siberia, but it's modern day uh, this region, which back in ancient times would probably be the Scythians. You don't need to know that, but the Scythians were another class of people that lived back um, uh, in Old Testament times that were a warlike nomadic people that also uh, rode on horseback. But it says here they were gathered together, Gog and Magog, symbolically which are all the wicked coming against the city of God, and it says to do battle. And it's interesting because the way that this should actually be read from the Greek language is really not to battle, but rather for the battle. So the definite article, the definite article, actually lays stress on a particular battle, not just any kind of a battle, oh, let's just fight. No, but the battle, the final attempt at overthrowing and defeating God by the wicked, led by Satan, and all the wicked that have ever lived, all the Satan's angels that fell with him. So this is the last conflict between God and those in rebellion against him, the final battle that ever will be in the universe. And then, yes, that expression, the sand of the sea, meaning really symbolically beyond calculation. Do you remember when God spoke to Abraham in Genesis, and he told him that his descendants would be as numerous as the sand of the sea? And that's not, of course, a, a literal thing, but it's supposed to be a symbolic expression of beyond computation. It is a huge, vast number. So, all right, here's my map, people, Gog and Magog. This area up in here today, now this is actually in southern, the southern region of Russia with the, the Black Sea, the Caspian Sea, and this attempt that they are supposedly going to come down. And notice they're coming from the north. 
the northern direction is always the direction symbolically where God's throne is located. And so Satan, if you read in Ezekiel 28 and Isaiah 14, wanted to sit on the sides of the north because that is the location of God's throne. He wanted to be like God. And so these, this power, which existed back in antiquity, is a symbol for the wicked who try and take God's throne and take the position of overthrowing the government of God there in the New Jerusalem. So anyway, that's just a small side point there. Let's look at verse 9, the battle itself. Not a much of a battle when you're, I mean, Satan knows that you can't go against God and expect to win. But he deceived people anyway. So verse 9, and they, this is Satan and all of his hosts, the wicked that are with him. They went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about and the beloved city. And fire came down from who? God. From God out of heaven and did what? God. Now the Greek word for devour is significant. Don't miss this. We're going to see what it, that actually means. In just a second. Under the leadership of Satan, march against the camp of the righteous. He has deceived them into thinking they can make an attempt at overthrowing the city because they're far more numerous on the outside than they are on the inside. The, the few that are saved on the inside. But with God, if God be for us, who can finish the verse? Who can be against us? Romans 8, 37. I mean, that is a powerful passage if God is for us. And rather, if we're on God's side, you're always in the majority, no matter what the outcome in the final outcome is. So the word here, it says they compassed the camp and the city. It just means to compass, to surround, encircle, completely surrounding. We're going to lay siege to God's capital, the New Jerusalem. Yes? But the New Jerusalem didn't come all the way down to earth. Good question. We're going to see that in this cycle, it actually, because this is at the end of the millennium, it has come down. At this time, that's a very good point, but if you're reading linearly, which I have done, you don't see that until 21 verse 2. If you have your Bible in front of you where John says, I saw the holy city coming down from God out of heaven, but that's in a different cycle, which we're actually going to see next time. It's actually a fourth cycle with a different focus on the new Jerusalem itself. It starts over a new series of, of thought. But at this time... Because the events that we're looking at here in this cycle, this is at the end of the millennium because the new Jerusalem comes down at the end of the thousand years. And that's when the, risk, the wicked dead are resurrected to life again and make this desperate attempt at overtaking the city. It's interesting here where it says they surrounded the camp and the beloved city. The word camp literally means a, a, a line of battle, an army in battle uh, in a lineup for a fort of some sorts. And the beloved city. I think some people just, uh, think that there's two different, a camp and a city here. I think it's just a description of the same thing, the New Jerusalem. That's my view. Uh, you're welcome to, to think of it differently. But the beloved city, and this is the New Jerusalem itself. So when it says fire comes down from God out of heaven, I think this is actually literal fire that comes down from God. And the word devour is an interesting word in the Greek. It literally means to down eat. To down eat, down eat. In fact, if I were to have a, a batch of fresh chocolate chip cookies up here, and I would say I devoured them, how many do you think would be left over? None. None. I mean, we understand the word devour in English, it means to be completely consumed. And so what we're going to see, the word devour means that it is to completely, this is the fire, the purifying, cleansing fire of God that co completely destroys all of the wicked and those, the devil and his angels, leaving nothing behind. There's not any continual, everlasting, burning hell where sin and the devil is always perpetuated and continuing to exist. But it is annihilation, complete eradication, a complete end to sin. A complete ending, and the word devour signifies to down eat completely the fire, those that are thrown in the fire. And then it says in verse 10, let's read that verse. It says, and the devil that deceived them was cast into what? The lake of fire and brimstone. And it mentions where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. All right. Well, wait a second, Pastor Hyman. It sounds like forever and ever. Now, I understand forever means it doesn't end. But we have to look at what is actually said there. And I think there's a clue if you look at um, where, it, where it says... In verse 10, the end, it says forever. Is that one word or two words? One word. Oh, it's one word in your Bible. Okay, I've got it as two words in my Bible. For and ever. And the Greek, actually, the way it's laid out, I'll explain. 
that the word here or expression forever and ever, the literal meaning of the words that are translated ever and ever is really to the ages of the ages. And the word ages is the word for, it's actually the word eon. You might have heard of that. Eon is a period of time, but it has a definite beginning and a definite ending. An eon or a space or measure of time. And so what is described here is that the fire will come down and devour the wicked until the ages of the ages or the eons of the eons until they are completely destroyed and their lives are over and they are no longer in existence. They no longer live anymore. Yes? What does Ellen White say about those who have um, been especially wicked in history and that they will be tormented more than the others? Right. And, and that principle is in the Bible. You know, it says in Luke 12, 47 and 48, it talks about, and that servant which knew his Lord's will and prepared not himself shall be beaten with many stripes. But he that knew not his Lord's will and did not prepare himself and did things worthy of stripes or did things that were wrong shall be beaten with few stripes. And so there is this principle that, that based on the knowledge and information and understanding a person has and the wickedness of their lives, and I think we get this in our own justice system, there are kids that steal bicycles. And, and hopefully none of them are on death row, but those on death row have done, you know, double homicides and other things that are much more egregious. Are they both crimes? Are they both sins? Yes, but there are, um, and I think of even Jesus himself in John 19, when he's talking to Pilate, he tells him that the one that handed me over to you has the greater sin. That's John 19 verse 11. Jesus says, speaking of the Jewish people and Caiaphas in particular, has a greater sin than even Pilate because he had an understanding that should have prevented him from doing that. Yes? What, what point in biblical history do these different punishments come down? You know, um, you know the, what, the ones who were horrible and evil, you know, the ones at Jesus' trial and Hitler and, you know, as a verse to somebody who just didn't you know, do what they should. Yes, well, I think it's at this time, you know, we're, we're going to see an expression here coming up in our next cycle, our final cycle, that talks about that God will give every man according to their works or their deeds, that will be their, their punishment. And so it's based on what they have done. Romans 2.6 says that God, um, or is 2.11, it's either 2.6 or 2.11, where it says God um, will render to every man according to his deeds. That your action, I mean, that is ultimately, that determines if, that your actions show whether your faith is genuine or not. And so the, the actions of people that have been horribly wicked have used, you know, they have been especially evil in causing others to sin and killing and murdering and taking other people's lives. They're going to be more responsible and have a greater sense of punishment when this final punishment comes. This is the final reckoning of accounts where it says in Romans, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, I will repay that it's not vengeance isn't mine or any of the rest of us, but God is the one who says, I will be the one to repay them for what they have done. And he has a perfect understanding and account of all of what they have done and will know exactly what they deserve to have in terms of their punishment. Yeah, go ahead, follow up, and then... So, I gotta ask, I mean, are they gonna burn longer? Or whatever, are they gonna suffer more? That's a good question. And my understanding is that, yes, they will actually suffer or burn longer as a result of their uh, their wickedness with of course the longest one being Satan himself because he is the root of sin if you read in Malachi it talks about the root and branches just like Jesus I'm the vine and ye are the branches Jesus is the vine we are the it is the same with Satan he will have the the final punishment because of all the sin that he has instigated and has caused throughout the whole universe and at that time, because we see now the effects of sin and how bad it is, no one in the universe, none of the righteous will question, is God being unfair or mean when he does this? Because we've seen how terrible sin is, and we will be grateful that it's completely eradicated. And that the punishment is based on the actions and works of the angels and of the people and, and of, to varying degrees. You know, that's not for me to sort out entirely, but I guess when we're there in the thousand years, we will have the privilege of judging angels and seeing just how bad and how terrible the things are that they have plotted and planned and they have done. So it's, uh, it's, it's very sobering, but 
God is going to repay everyone according to what they deserve. He will not give anyone a raw deal, whether they should, should have been saved or they should be lost and they, in, in, in whatever ways. It's, it's not something I think that God enjoys because it says in Ezekiel 33, verse 11, As I live, saith the Lord, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. And so he tells us, as I live, saith the Lord. So God is talking, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked. But at the same time, as a God who is perfectly just, he will, I think, execute justice to the, the fullest, complete extent of whatever is deserved by that person or individual. Did you have a, a connected thought, Frank, or something on that? You know, um, when the Lord says that vengeance is his, mm -hmm. and essentially says, don't take vengeance, let's leave it. Right. I think it's very significantly because we couldn't carry it out properly. And when we tried, it would change us in bad and negative ways. When we try and take over the work of the Lord, we can't do it right, and we probably mess it up severely. So it would probably make us a worse person to try and carry out what only God knows how to do. Does that make sense? Yeah, oh, it does make very good sense. I think that's an excellent point. If you didn't hear that in the back, Frank was pointing out that if it were in our hands to execute vengeance or, or justice in some of these particulars, it would be bad for our own character and our own experience to have to go through with the, the punishing aspect of those who, even though they deserve it, but to be in some way connected to that and having to bring it about. I'm trying to find the, the reference. I don't know if it's in Isaiah 38, 37, uh, but it talks about this idea of, and somebody else in here maybe uh, will know this, um, where it talks about God's work, his strange work, judgment. Does anyone know the reference for that? Isaiah, it's, it just, it's talking about when God has to administer punishment on the creatures he's created. Strange act. Yeah, that his strange work, strange act. Yes, Dr. Triumph. Isaiah 28, 21. 28, 21. If you want to write that reference down, thank you so much. Isaiah 28, 21. It says, For the Lord shall rise up as in Mount Perizim. He shall be wroth as in the valley of Gibeon that he may do his work, his strange work, and bring to pass his act, his strange act. And so that is a reference to when God himself has to administer justice. And even God, it is a foreign thing for him to have to, to do this, but being consistent with his character of justice and mercy, blended together, he will do it though. And, and, I, and I'm thankful that it's, it's his, not ours. It's not ever my place to try and, and step in and take care of those details. So this lake of fire here, you might recall there was a lake of fire in Revelation 19 at the second coming of Jesus. And here the earth again at the end of the millennium is turned into the surface of the earth, kind of a sea of flames, which both consumes the wicked and also purifies the earth completely and entirely. That's the, the, the purpose of fire is it is purifying. And uh, it talks about here this idea that they would be tormented. I think we've spent some time on that already in the plural the subject of the verb is the devil the beast and the false prophet and it should be noted that the beast and the false prophet are not literal but symbolic creatures but the the punishment here that falls upon the wicked uh will be a serious grievous one but god is telling us these things so that we would not have to be part of it amen i mean he does not want anyone to be part of any of the the the, the destruction of the wicked I mean, it's a strange act to him. He says, I have no pleasure in it. It's, it's something that is just foreign to his, his, his nature. But he will, in fact, do that in order to be fully just and to eliminate sin. Because he will have a clean universe. A clean, pure, brand new heaven and a new earth. And that's, of course, in the next chapter. But it will be new entirely and completely restored. All right, here's our last cycle Hold on, let's see if we can go through this without too much time. This is our last, our third cycle, as we look at verse um, 11. And it says here, this is actually the focus is on the destruction of the wicked at the end. Verse 11, and I saw a great what? White throne. White throne and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven did what? Fled away. away, and there was found no place for them. What does that sound like to you? What, did, what event does that sound like where you see then the, the, does it sound like the second coming at all? It should, because the events of this uh, verse 
actually take place at the second coming, even though just the verse before we were talking about the end of the millennium. Now we're back in the second, the third cycle, looking at events at the beginning of the millennium. And you might say, well, how do you know that, Pastor Hyman? I mean, really, how do you know this is the, the second coming of Jesus? And if you look at Revelation 6, verses 14 through 17, in the sixth seal, it talks about the wicked then at that time uh, who are living. It says the sky receded like a scroll and every mountain and every island fled out of his place does that sound similar to what we just read here about the uh the fleeing away of the earth and the heaven fled away and there was found no place for them the mountains and the islands and then if you read also in revelation 6 here verses 14 to 17 the wicked said to the rocks and to the mountains fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sits where on the throne so there is a key phrase right there, on the throne, a great white throne. When does this throne appear? It appears at the second coming of Jesus. And so you might say, well, didn't in Revelation 19, Jesus was coming on a horse. Absolutely. But that's under the symbol of a military commander. Kings sit on thrones. And so when Jesus, in this representation, he is being depicted and described as a king. Here, as he is sitting on this great white throne at his second coming. So... There is, make sure if you're taking notes, you connect Revelation 6, which is a description of the second coming under the sixth seal, with this verse, which also shows or refers to the same kind of events as Jesus coming um, the second time. So, anyway, all right, let's continue on and find in our next verse, verse 12, it says, And I saw the dead, small and great, do what? How can that be? It says they're dead, doesn't it? It does. Standing before God, how can this be? All right, we'll explain. And what was opened? The books were opened, and then another what was opened? Another singular or plural book? Singular, right? Singular book was opened, which is called the what? Book of Life, and the dead were, were judged out of those things which were written in the what? Singular or plural? Plural, okay, books, according to their works. All right, so you might, why does it matter? The book singular is the book of life. The books, plural, are the books of records, which are the records of everything, every thought, every action we've ever said or done. Those are the books of records. The book of life, singular, is just a list of names of all of those who've ever professed to accept Jesus as their Savior. Book singular. So, Revelation 20, verse 12, is describing the judgment of the wicked dead during the millennium. Just like in the first part of this cycle, we saw in the last verse, the second coming of Jesus and the great white throne... Here we're seeing the events during the millennium, and it says, I saw the dead standing before God. Small and great stand before God. How is this possible um, since the, uh, the dead at this time, the righteous were resurrected and taken to heaven, the wicked are destroyed, they're alive, and the wicked dead just stay dead during the thousand years? How can there be a, how can the, the dead be standing before God? So it also mentions that small and great by the way, God is no respecter of persons, right? right. Whether you are a, a homeless person or president of the United States, you know, those titles mean nothing to God. He cares about what is your heart desire and what have you done with your life in terms of wanting to give it to him, your heart, your life, your body, your mind, your soul, all of who you are. And so every wicked person will have to give account of their evil deeds. Revelation uh, Romans 14 verse 12 says that every one of us shall give account of himself to God. Every one. And so, Romans 14, verse 12. Now, here comes the, the point, though. How can the dead, if they're dead, stand before God? And this is during the thousand years and the wicked dead are dead. How is it that they do this? Well, it's obvious that dead people cannot stand before God personally. And so, how is it they're standing there before God? What have we just made a big deal about reading? All right, through the lives of their records. And this is, by the way, incidentally, the same way the righteous stand before God. Through our records, as we came to understand in Daniel 8.14, with the cleansing of the sanctuary, which began in 1844, the first angel's message, the hour of his judgment is come, that even right now, the righteous are the ones who are being judged, and their cases are being examined, and the records of their lives are being considered to see, have they completely, has their lives and their profession followed what they have said they believe? And so, the wicked dead... This is the time when they are judged. The righteous are already in heaven. They're, they're, they're not being judged. They've already passed through their judgment. So the standing before God is through their records. 
And you might re recall, I don't have this verse up here, but 2 Corinthians 5 verse 10 says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may give account of himself, that everyone may, um, whether he hath done good or whether he hath done evil. Anyway, it says we must all appear, 2 Corinthians 5 10, and that means good and bad. And we appear by way of our records. The Bible is so clear in both the Old and the New Testament, through the records of our lives, that is what God investigates. You remember Daniel 7, way back, where it says, The court was seated, and the books were opened. Daniel 7, verse 10. The books were opened, that's the books of record, and that case is referring to the righteous. Daniel 7, verse 10. Yes, Frank. You know, where it says every person will give an accounting for their deeds. Mm -hmm. I, I know the scripture doesn't say this, or unless I'm not aware it does, but I can foresee the wicked when they're alive. Millions mm -hmm. of people simultaneously confessing to the Lord. You won't be able to hear it all the cacophony. But mm -hmm. people dump, pouring out their hearts and repenting, but it's too late to be saved. Uh, what a terrible sound that would be, mm -hmm. if that's true. Oh, sure, sure. Because at this, uh, we're going to see that the, the wicked have a chance to see what their case, what their decision is, I mean, why they are excluded from heaven, and to see the city and, and what they have lost and forfeited by just choosing to live the short lives that we all live on earth for themselves. They'll see and know because everyone at the end of the thousand years, everyone that has ever lived will be alive at that time. And so it will be very serious. And I pray that all of us in here and our friends and family and neighbors and children and everyone connected to us will be inside the holy city by the grace of God. And it's all, all powerful because all possible rather because God is able he is more than able to do that so all right so that's what it says there also some more details of verse 12 so it says the books and a few comments on that literally meaning books the Greek has their definite article these are the books containing the record of the lives of men no sentence passed upon any wicked person will be arbitrary biased or unfair do you believe that do you believe that God is righteous in all his ways and holy in all his works Psalm 145, 17, he is. And Daniel 7, verse 10 talks about the time for the, the opening of the books for the righteous as it relates to the hour of his judgment is come in 1844. So, and then it says another book was opened, or one more book, and this is the book of life, and that book of life just contains names. The names of every person who is claimed to accept Jesus as their Savior. And that's mentioned in the Old Testament, in the New Testament, the book of life. I pray God all of our names are there and that our works are corresponding to our profession to be followers of Jesus. So, though we are saved by grace through faith, that's Ephesians 2, 8, 9, that is very true, our works reveal whether our faith is genuine or not. That's why it talks about, I'm not, I'm not saved by, none of us are saved by our works, but those are just an evidence that the faith on the inside is really genuine in connecting and believing what God says in His Word. It just testifies to the the authenticity of our faith or not. All right, Revelation 20, verse 13. It says, And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged, every man, here a repetition of the same verse, according to what? According to their works. The actions are what are reflective of the character on the inside. So the first part of this verse is interesting, and this was something that I, as I've looked through this, uh, something that I learned just recently, and I hope it will make sense to you, that it is describing here when it says the sea and death and hell, um, those that have been, this is referring to the wicked, those that have gone down to their graves because of the life of transgression and sin, that when it says that they gave up the dead, it actually is referring to to give up the dead at the sea and the grave, and hell is just the word, in, in Greek is the word Hades. And Hades just is the word for grave or the realm of the place of the dead. Death and is personified. The location where people in the ground are buried is called hell, not as in a place where there's fire and burning. It's just where dead people are buried. That's literally what the word hell means, a place where dead people are buried. And so when it says that the grave and the sea gave up their dead, it is a, it's a description. To give up the dead means they must have come back to life. If the dead were buried, because you know when people die, sometimes they're buried out at sea, if they're out, you know, on a ship or something, sometimes, most of the time in the ground or wherever. But when it says they gave up, and by the way, where it says delivered up the dead, it's actually the same Greek word as gave up here. They just translated it differently in the English. Gave up the dead, delivered up the dead. It all means it's giving up. It means that it's a resurrection of the dead. This is the wicked dead who were there located. 
Yes, Carol. I'm just human, and I have a hard time comprehending the logistics of all this. You know, I know God is just, we can't understand him, but I mean, this is just incredible. It, well, it is. It's all, I mean, this is when you consider all the, the who've ever died. And this would include, what about the people before the flood? I mean, all the people living before the flood, only eight people got on the boat. All the rest of them were killed. Obviously, they were wicked. They're going to resurrect again at the end of the millennium and be part of this and see, ultimately, they're going to see what they have forfeited in eternal loss. And, and so, I, but God, in his all-knowing, all-power, all-wisdom, uh, he, is anything too hard for the Lord? Genesis 18, 14. A rhetorical question, no, nothing is too hard for the Lord. So as I mentioned, the word hell is the Greek word for Hades, and that literally means just the grave itself, the place where a dead person is buried, or the realm, the location of where people are buried that are dead. And this is all a reference here to the second resurrection, which takes place at the end of the millennium. And I have a timeline that will show all these together at the end. I hope that will be helpful. And it says they were judged, that is, the wicked will see the record of their lives. I mean, God is so good that even the wicked will see what they have lost and why they have lost it. All of the wicked will have that opportunity to see and to know that. All right, two more short verses and we'll conclude. It says in verse 14, and death and hell were cast where? That's personification, if you know what that is. Personification to give personal, personal, uh, personal characteristic traits to things that aren't persons. Into the lake of fire. This is the what? Second death. There's that expression again, the second death. Death is the death of the wicked in the lake of fire of which there is no resurrection. It is a ceasing of existence for all the rest of eternity. And death and hell here are, are kind of given a personification. They're, why are they personified and represented as being thrown into the lake of fire? It's because those as, as concepts dying and then the place where people have to be buried, that's going to be thrown into the lake of fire and eradicated, eliminated for all eternity. And they will never, ever happen again. No one will ever, ever die again. There will never be a need to bury someone in a grave again. It will be done and completed forever and ever. The universe will be perfect and clear and clean for all eternity. Amen. And so this lake of fire, thank you. The lake of fire, this cleansing fire, the whole earth is just kind of just surrounded and, and embroiled in this lake of fire except for really where the city of the New Jerusalem rests. Just like the ark was preserved back in Noah's flood, back in the Old Testament from all the angry waters, so too the New Jerusalem, which is the capital of God, brought down to this earth once the wicked are trying to attack the city, it's already here, it will be the only safe place on the whole earth. The entire earth itself will be wrapped in a sea of liquid fire. And in this second death is described as an eternal death. It is the opposite of eternal life. That is one way of defining it um, in the book Early Writings. The definition of the second death is the opposite of eternal life. I mean, there's no other clear way to say it. it is eternal death from which there is no hope of a resurrection. And I like how the book of Obadiah says this. I actually have one memory verse in all 66 books of the Bible. This is my one memory verse in the book of Obadiah. It's only one chapter. But it's describing the wicked, and it says, They shall be as though they had not been. I mean, their existence, I mean, imagine if I am part of that group, which I hope I'm not, but I will be as if I had never existed before. My life and memory and it will just be gone completely. And it's just a sad, sad ending, which, which doesn't have to be that way. It does not have, that's not God's will for anyone to ever cease to be existed. You know, the Bible says we are fearfully and wonderfully made, that God created us and made us for a special purpose and uh, to live with him. And now we come to our last verse in this chapter. It says, And whosoever was not found written where? In the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Now, what does it sound like to you when it says in verse 15, Whosoever was not found? If you're not finding something, what does it sound like you're doing to try to find something? That you're looking, right? You're looking. And so I think that fits well with what is being done here during the thousand years because the wicked, as they are looking through the, the book of life, their names are not there because the records of their lives testify that they are, they are completely living and contrary against the will of God. So, and I see your hand, Vicki. Just let me finish this slide and I'll take it real quick. So it says, whosoever was not found, 
Only the names of the faithful will be retained in the book of life. The, the names of those who do not endure until the end will be blotted out. And we saw this in Revelation chapter 3 in the church of, uh, what is the fifth church? That was this morning, Sardis, Philadelphia, Pergamum, no, it's, uh, is it, is it Sardis? I think it's the church of Sardis. And it talks about the same thing, that their names would not be blotted out of the book of life, those that overcome. And it's referring to the same thing here, that there would be a searching and looking through the book of life for the names of those that are recorded there. And the lake of fire, when God finally purifies the earth, it will appear like a boundless lake of fire. So what have we seen tonight as we try to come to a close in uh, some of these major pieces here? Here's our timeline with the millennium all together. And I told you if you're sitting in the back, you'll have a hard time seeing it. But at the beginning of the millennium, we have the second coming of Jesus. And when Jesus comes, the saints are caught up where? In the air to go to heaven. And this, at this time, the saints are caught up to heaven. The first resurrection, which is the resurrection of all the righteous, occur. And they are caught up, of course, with the saints, the living saints, actually go up second because it says the dead in Christ rise first. And then the wicked are actually destroyed, the wicked living when Jesus comes. And the wicked dead, like those who were denied in the flood, they just remain dead. Now, during the millennium, Satan, of course, is bound. He's bound on the front end, but he remains bound and stays that way. And the saints, though, are in heaven doing a work of auditing or judgment, looking over all the records of the wicked and determining, was God right? Was he fair? And the answer in every case is emphatically, yes, he is. In every time, every case. So the earth remains in a state of darkness and desolation, that abyss or bottomless pit that Satan is bound to. And then at the end of the thousand years, we see the new Jerusalem, which has the saints and Jesus descending down from heaven down to this earth. And this second resurrection, all the wicked, as the city comes down, all the wicked dead that have ever lived are resurrected to life. Everyone is living that's ever lived on planet Earth at this time, the end of the thousand years. And then the devil goes out and tries to deceive the wicked and, and rally them to attack the new Jerusalem and to over, overtake it. And then, as they make their way and actually surround the city, fire comes down from God of heaven and destroys the wicked. And... Then the wicked experience was called the second death, the death in which there is no return, no hope of any, any life afterwards. And then we're going to see in our last two chapters, I hope you'll come back and sorry for keeping you so long tonight, a new heaven and a new earth. It's going to be so grand and glorious, it will give us strength and cheer us along the way to face the challenges that we face, to fight against the, 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 the wiles of the devil and to put on the armor of God and to, and to reach out for Jesus for the help that we need and the grace that we need to overcome and to live his life. So, um, and I can put this back up here, and I, I basically just read all of the things that are up here. There's a lot of things that are even, so I'm going to go ahead and pray, and I'll let you go. Oh, thank you. I have someone reminding me just very quickly before I let you go, and I have a few copies of this. There's going to be a gospel concert uh, this uh, Saturday night uh, here in our church upstairs at 6 o'clock. Uh, a, a young man named Corey Leineweber is going to be performing, and I've heard him before a year or two ago, and he is excellent. Uh, he lives, I think, out in Oklahoma, but he will be here. It's a free concert. You're all encouraged to come. Uh, just great gospel music, great vocals and a guitar. Um, I hope to see you there. I plan to be there. Um, Vicki, can I pray and I'll take your question? Oh, I did answer it. Oh, good. Good, good, good. Good, good, good. All right. Well, let's pray, and I will dismiss you guys. Thank you so much for being here. Oh, dear Father in heaven, Lord, these events that we've looked at tonight, all of them are, are in the future. But we can prepare, and we can make changes in our lives now as we look to Jesus, and as we've talked about, as we have our minds transformed and renewed by studying your word, by praying, and by, by following, by faith, all that you ask us to do, we can be changed. We can be ready and prepared for your second coming. Lord, I pray that not one person here would lose faith, would, would lose heart, would lose strength and confidence in you. The Bible says you are mighty to save. You have a great strong arm to restore and revive and renew all of us. May our weakness grasp your strength, and may we receive the grace that we need to help in times of need. Bless each person here. Take them home safely, I pray. In Jesus' name, let all God's people say amen and amen.